Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Before we start, I just want to play a promo for my new friends, Shelley and Mary, who have got a fantastic podcast called Latter Day Lesbian. And it's about Shelley's journey from being a Mormon to renouncing her religion and then finding love with a woman. It's funny. It's poignant. It is so fantastic. They're doing amazingly well. They've got so many downloads so fast because it's such a unique and interesting topic. So please check out Latter-day Lesbian Podcast. You're going to absolutely love it. And here's the promo. Hey, everybody. I'm Mary. And I'm Shelly, and we are the hosts of Latter-day Lesbian. The podcast about an ex-Mormon gay girl trying to figure out her life. That's right. And that ex-Mormon gay girl is me. Check this out. I was born and raised Mormon. I got married young because that's what you do. Then I had seven kids, then I left the Mormon church, and then I came out of the closet, and then I got divorced. Whew, that's a lot. What's next, Shelly? I don't know. I'm still trying to figure it out. It's life, and we want to talk about it. Okay, so join us. Latter-day Lesbian is available on your favorite podcast app. And thanks. Talk to you later. Welcome to Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. Today I'm here with Dr. Michael Eason. Hi, Dr. Michael. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. It's really exciting to chat to you. Now, you're a psychologist in Hong Kong. What sort of people or issues do you deal with generally? I deal with all mental health issues and diagnoses, such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder. Some of my specialties are working with substance abuse and addictions, and also working with the LGBTQ plus population here. And I work with individuals and couples. Fantastic. And that's actually what we're here to talk about today. We're going to have a little bit of a focus on the LGBTQ plus community with in particular transgender people. Do you actually work with transgender people in Hong Kong? I do. I have several clients who identify as transgender. In my case, they are primarily in the teenage population. I've worked with adults before. But here in Hong Kong, it has been primarily adolescents and teenagers. What is the difference between sexual orientation and gender identity? Okay, so these two terms are often used interchangeably, but they're quite different. So sexual orientation is actually who you have affectionate feelings for, be it male or female or both or neither, is your sexual orientation is who you're attracted to, okay? Gender identity is what gender you identify as, be it male, female, or neither, or some combination of male and female. So gender identity is who you are, whereas the sexual orientation is who you're attracted to. That's really clear. When do people typically become aware of these two different parts of their personality? Well, that can vary a lot. There are instances to identify as transgender, for example, as early as age two, possibly, actually, definitely before the age of five. But some people struggle with the process and do not come out until much later in life. With sexual orientation is similar. Many people know by the age of adolescence, but sometimes do not come out until much later in life. Come out meaning admit and identify and kind of share publicly their sexual orientation or their gender identity. It can really vary depending on the personality of the person and also probably 
their family, their background, how open people are and how accepting they are of people who are, what's the word? I don't want to say different. Minority. Minority. Thank um, you. A sexual minority or, or a gender minority. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. So do you feel that it's easier for people to come out or to be more accepting of their gender identity or their sexual orientation if they're in a more open, progressive family? It certainly is. If the family is accepting, supportive, and the culture, the environment, these individuals who have supportive families are much more successful in later in life in terms of not having mental health concerns and just being more well-adjusted in society. The family support is a huge, huge part of that. I'd imagine you would work with families as well as the teenagers themselves with the transgender issues. Is that right? Or do you just work with the kids? So I will primarily focus with the kids. However, of course, when the whole family transitions, that's sort of the expression we use. So we do have to work with the whole family because it is a massive, massive change. And there's a lot of education that needs to happen around the siblings, around the parents to sort of best help the person with the transition. So it is definitely a family event. What are some of the changes that a family might have to go through if they have a transgender child? Changing pronouns would be one of the first ones. So the pronouns, the name, of course. So when a transgender individual comes out and wants to transition, often one of the first things to change is the name into a name that matches the gender of their choice. So oftentimes the opposite sex name which they have. So their name assigned at birth in the transgender community will become what is called a dead name, D-E-A-D, dead name. And once that happens, you're no longer supposed to use that name. They choose their own name and we need to respect that, whatever it is that they choose to be called. So that becomes their new name. They will use pronouns. He may turn into she or they may use gender neutral pronouns such as they, we, us. They, for example, is often very popular. And there's a whole list of other pronouns that I haven't memorized all of them. You can find them online, certainly. And then, of course, it's just often the expectations of the future that the parents might have held. For example, if you have someone who was born at birth as a female, then the parents may have expectations or dreams about their wedding day and picturing their child in a wedding dress, etc. And if that child then transitions to male, of course, those hopes and dreams have to alter, have to be changed. So it's often a process of grief and loss for the parents. So putting away the child that was assigned at birth, the gender of that child, for example, maybe grieving the loss of their child as assigned female at birth, and then adjusting to having now a son instead of a daughter. So there is a process of grief and a process of loss for the parents, for many parents, not all of them. So, but that is often something that I work with some of the parents. Is there a correlation between sexual orientation and gender? Sexual orientation and and your gender gender identities. I think my point is that they are not linked, are they? Like who you're attracted to has nothing to do with your gender identity. They're completely separate. Right. And we can't make assumptions about that. No, you should never make assumptions because if someone is a transgender, we have no idea what sexuality, if they identify as gay or heterosexual, bisexual, some people may be asexual, not having interest in any sexual activity. So there is no correlation. They're totally separate components of personality. Do you think that gender and sexuality are innate or influenced by a person's experience? Well, this is a tough question, isn't it? I know, it's a really tough question. Yeah, it is very controversial and I'm really interested to see what you'd say. The best answer to most or many questions in psychology is it depends. I do think it depends because certainly we do know there are hormonal influences in the womb and genetic and chromosomal issues that can influence one's sexuality and one's gender for sure. And definitely experiences in life in terms of what the culture is like and what messages people get from the media and religion and their parents. So I think it is this this cascade of influences that ultimately determine someone's sexuality and their gender. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought you might say. So yeah, that, right. that makes complete sense. So it really can be innate, but it can be influenced by the environment or your circumstances or your experiences. And also it is fluid. It can be fluid. It yes. can evolve and change throughout the lifespan. Absolutely. When it comes to labeling, 
nobody should label others, should they? It should be up to people to decide how they want to be labeled for the want of a better word. Well, exactly. And similar to how a transgender individual chooses their own name, you know, it's up to them. We should respect that. And so in terms of someone's sexuality and the labels that attach to that, I'm not a huge fan of labels. I mean, they're socially constructed, meaning we sort of, in essence, kind of make up these labels. I don't think, for example, the term homosexuality wasn't coined until sometime in the 1800s, the late 1800s. So really, so what we do is we just sort of, we see a cluster of behaviors. And because as humans, we like to categorize, we like to classify things. So we take this cluster of behaviors and we assign a word to it, a definition, a label. Really, these behaviors have existed throughout history, throughout the evolution of our species. We just didn't have a word or a label for them until more recently. That's so interesting. Some people don't want to fit into any labels. And that's why there's so many new different labels being created, like demisexual and gender fluid and gender non-binary. And there's loads and loads of them because people don't necessarily want to be pigeonholed in one particular area. Right. They find labels to be stifling and suffocating. And then we have a label for that, which is, you know, the non-binary, gender non-binary, gender non-conforming, gender fluid. So these are individuals that don't accept the binary, which meaning that the dichotomous male-female, they don't accept that that's all there is to sexual expression or gender expression that is more varied than that. So they just reject that. And gender expression is a very fluid thing. So maybe sometimes more of a feminine appearance, sometimes more of a masculine appearance or behavior. And it just can vary. It just can vary depending on how they feel. And I think the message that comes from what you're saying is that people should be allowed to be true to who they are. How important do you think it is to accept people for who they are and let people express themselves in any way that they want, as long as it's not dangerous to others? All right, exactly. That's the thing. As long as it's doing no harm to others, it's extremely important actually to affirm someone's identity, to affirm someone's sexuality. And studies have shown that those individuals, like I said, have much better outcomes later in life are much more successful emotionally and professionally. And that goes back to the question you said earlier about family, and that just can't be overstated how important it is to have the family acceptance, not just for gender identity, but also sexual orientation. Yeah. And because the family needs to be involved in that. Absolutely. And I think that there's so many young kids committing suicide really around the world because they're unable to feel accepted for their sexuality or their gender identity, and they got nowhere to turn. And there's a lot of parents that just will disown their children if they come out as gay or bisexual or if they have a different gender identity than what is socially acceptable for the family. And that's such a massive shame, isn't it? It's just a huge stain on the fabric of society that we have that. There are recent statistics I was reading, actually 2018 from the the Human Rights Council, I believe, that transgender teens or teens that identify as non-binary which we've already talked about, have a suicide attempt rate of 41.8. 41.8. That's staggering. That's huge. Huge. That's massive. That's 2018 statistics. We also know for transgender adults, males and females, it's also in the 40s, which is, if I recall correctly, I think that's about 10 times the normal population, the rate of suicide in the normal population or the non-transgender population. So rates of suicide or suicide attempts in the 40s, is that's not okay. That shouldn't no. be acceptable. That can be down to so many different factors, can't it? The fact that they're not accepted by their families or maybe bullied or maybe they're mistreated or maybe they can't get work or housing. Like adult transgender people may be discriminated against because of their situation. There's so many different factors that can play into it. Mm-hmm. But as a society, we've got a responsibility to make changes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Many transgender teenagers or adolescents and children, they feel all alone. They feel isolated. They don't see role models maybe in their community, of course, on television sometimes. They feel they're the only ones. And especially if they live in kind of more rural or small towns, small communities. And in those cases, they don't even have the resources like an LGBT counselor or therapist like like myself or an LGBTQ plus support center as they do in big cities like New York and LA. So in those cases, they may go to a counseling clinic and it's in a small town, a small community. 
the counselors may not necessarily be knowledgeable or trained in these issues or may actually be actually antagonistic. And because there's such a thing, the gay conversion therapy. Yes. I hate to say it because we should never talk about religion, but, you know, religious factors can really play into it a lot. I've been listening to a podcast recently about the Church of Christ and the way that they tried to literally pray aggressively and beat the homosexuality out of one of the young men in the congregation. Mm -hmm. And it's just like this just happened last year or a couple of years ago. Like, how can this still be happening in this day and age? What's wrong with these people? Mm -hmm. The whole concept of kind of pray the gay away or send them to a kind of gay conversion therapy. And gay conversion therapy is where you send the child or the individual to a therapist to convert them, to basically change their sexual orientation, which is impossible. It does not work and it's extremely unethical. Many, many, many of these individuals in attempting suicide or completing suicide because they're just being told who they are at their core is not okay. And there's really no way to change that. So conversion therapy is actually unethical and has not been discontinued by the American Counseling Association and every kind of legitimate body and if counseling in the world. So but there are people who will still do this if you pay them and they will do it. And but it's very unethical. So I recently saw a kind of a documentary about the treatment of uh, gay individuals in the Mormon religion. And there were a couple of actually a documentary by the lead singer of Imagine Dragons, who is a Mormon, but is very much supportive of the LGBTQ brothers and sisters in the religion and how they're trying to make change in the Mormon community. And they hosted a major concert. And so there are certain people in the religious community who want to hold to their core religious beliefs, but also somehow want to make the religion evolve to accept the LGBTQ community. And I think that's a majorly important trend moving forward. It is. And it's really good to see that that is happening. And for any trans or LGBT people out there who are listening, there are gay-friendly churches. There are are churches that are available that support transgender people as well, but you have to seek them out. So get online. You've got Google. That wasn't invented when I was a kid. (laughs) Yeah. And that's the thing that had been so devastating in the past where individuals felt like they had to choose between their identity or their sexuality and their church and their religion. And you don't have to, you don't have to choose between them. There are certainly very, very welcoming and inclusive churches and religious communities. They do exist, right? And you can find them on Google. Yeah. So hopefully that trend will continue and we'll have less and less discrimination against LGBTQ people from the church because there's a huge population of religious people around the world, no matter what denomination, and having that sort of negativity towards people's sexual and gender identity, it's just ridiculously sad. What do you think is the most troubling aspect of life for LGBTQ young people today? Most troubling, I'm not sure, because I don't know if there's a hierarchy, but things like there's an umbrella term called minority stress. So minority stress is just the stress that anyone in the minority may feel due to being disadvantaged, due to not having colleagues or companions that share their life experiences. There are things like bullying, of course, that is a huge bullying, harassment, levels of physical and sexual assault that the minorities experience, especially in the transgender community. So these are just daily struggles that they deal with. There's also something called heteronormative or heterosexism. Heterosexism is the assumption that everyone is heterosexual. That's like being at work and me saying to you, oh, what are you and your wife doing this weekend? Mm -hmm. You know, just making assumptions Mm -hmm. that somebody's straight when they may have a same-sex partner. Exactly. Just the assumption of heterosexuality. For example, in this time of year, because I identify as a gay male. And so if I, and this has happened to me when I go into a department store, right? And some of the sales clerk comes up to me, hey, would you like to buy this perfume for your girlfriend or something like that? Just the assumption that everyone is heterosexual, which then forces individuals such as myself to constantly decide, okay, do I need to come out? Do I need to just go along with it? This is this constant kind of thing. And, And on that note, I'll say with the coming out process, it's not a one-time event. So individuals have to come out over and over and over throughout their life. And that's so funny because I do not have to go around announcing that I'm straight anywhere. Right. I right. don't. I never have to. Unless I'm in a gay bar and someone hits on me. Right. Then you, you know, might have then to. Then I right? might have to. But apart from that, no. And it's true. Gay people have to keep coming out and coming out. 
and to selectively choose, right? When to make that decision. And yeah. is it, in those casual circumstances will someone ask you, you know, assumes that you have a wife or they assume you have a husband when you're the opposite. Sometimes it's just not worth it or you don't have the time. It's just a constant daily hassle. That is under that umbrella of minority stress. So it's just these little cumulative things, they add up. Do you feel sometimes that you'd like to educate people and say, well, actually, I'm gay, but you should actually not assume that everybody's heterosexual. And, you know, do you actually go into it in well, that kind of I mean, depth? depending on what kind of mood you're in, maybe. But yeah. usually, <laughs> usually people at home get in a hurry and they rush. Eh, no, no, yeah, no, yeah. no, thank you. Move on. It just depends. It's a frustrating situation. But the people don't mean any ill intent. And that's the thing. They're not malicious. They're just not as, you know, maybe informed about these issues or as aware. But I think when the more we do educational sessions, something like this, and conferences and just teaching, and the more you actually know someone, right, who's gay or bisexual or transgender, then you're more aware of the language that you use. Definitely. But you can pretty much bet that everyone out there, whether they know it or not, interacts with somebody who is in the LGBT community. Would you be willing to tell me about your childhood and your coming out story and what it was like for you growing up gay? Well, so I'm from the U.S. and I grew up in the southern part of the U.S., which is quite conservative and quite religious. Uh, and my family in particular is of the Southern Baptists and Southern oh, Baptists. Right? Yes, I know them. Yeah. It's yeah. pretty strict, uh, pretty conservative and definitely anti-gay. So in my experience, I was kind of outed as a teenager and my family didn't accept it too much, but I wasn't, of course, outcast or anything like that. Oh, that's my good. family just sort of would rather keep it a private matter sort of thing. So because of that, and I was in a very small town, a small community, I didn't really experiment a lot and experience dating, for example, until going off to university. You know, as a teenager then in that community, it was lonely and isolating, but we were just starting to get internet at the time. And so that helped. Did you use YouTube and coming out videos and things like that as a way of support and sort of finding your community? Sort of. And during that time is when the the television series, uh, Will and Grace, was on My air. brother loved that show. My brother's right, gay right. as well, and he loves Will and Grace, and that was something that meant so much to him to have that. Well, because it's so rare to see LGBT characters on television, especially in a positive way. That show was popular, I guess, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Of course, now we have more and more. Yeah, we've got Queer Eye for the Straight Guy and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. And you've got you transgender characters in Orange of the New Black, and we've got Caitlyn Jenner. and. So there's a lot more high profile in the media. Jazz Jennings, I'm not sure if you're aware of her. She's a teenage trans icon. She's amazing. And she's had a television series and her parents let her transition or they helped her to transition at the age of two or three. And her parents are absolutely amazing in the US. And she is one of the role models for trans teenagers. She's absolutely amazing. So you should check her out. Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, I'm she's a bit, super interesting. I'm a bit disconnected from American pop media at this oh, time. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I do know that we just had the is it Miss Universe or Miss... Yes, who, transgender. Miss Spain, Spain. Yes, transgender, transgender Miss Universe. First fa one. Finalist. That's big, isn't it? Huge. Yeah, huge. that's massive. And there was also a transgender modeling agency called Strut run by a friend of mine, Cecilio. And that was a reality TV show with all these trans models. And they're amazing people. And it was just brilliant. That's a great TV show as well. So there's really stuff starting to come into the mainstream media. And it's so good to see. And I think that makes it a little easier for kids these days than it was for you. And then for my brother, who's even older than you. Mm -hmm. And he didn't come out till he was 30 because, mm. you know, I think it was much harder as well. But thankfully, we didn't have that religious pressure and that background. But I think the loneliness is a big thing, isn't it, that young gay or trans kids can really face. And it's very hard to find that sort of tribe because we all want to belong, don't we? Well, it's a basic human need and, you know, this hierarchy of needs, Maslow's pyramid. And one of our basic needs is love and belonging, a sense of fitting in and finding our tribe because we are ultimately social creatures. And so that loneliness is something that can be very devastating, can, can lead to those feelings of depression, which leads to self-harm or suicide attempts. So that's why it's so important to have those role models in the media. Yeah, it is, because there's someone to identify with. And I think there's some awesome videos on YouTube, you know, kids coming out to their parents, and their parents mm -hmm. being amazing, and mm -hmm. kids with their coming out stories or their post-surgery transgender stories and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I think there's a lot of 
support available there and there's some really mm-hmm. good stuff out there. And I'm actually happening reading a book right now, a fiction book, just called This Is How It Always Is, as I believe the name of it. And it's the story of a family and their transgender child and the child's story of going through primary school and secondary school dealing with the transgender issue. So even just in fiction, and, and you know, it's just a book I picked up at the airport and happened to be the topic I was interested in. That's a lovely book. There are all kinds of things like that. And I guess the role model you mentioned is uh, in Orange is the New Black, Laverne Cox. Yes, yeah, she's a great. Wonderful yeah. actress and yeah. things like that. But when I was growing up, we only had Will and Grace. I remember one day when I went to Sunday school and the Sunday school teacher was talking about Will and Grace for whatever reason, talking about how it was something sinful and of the devil and no one should watch it. And I remember I intentionally made a conscious decision not to go back. I tried not to go back, you know, yeah. when I had family pressure to attend. It just wasn't a very good experience. No, I can imagine that would have been really terrible to have your one role model shot down. Did you feel like you were a sinner and that you were going to go to hell and that did that worry you as a child or did you kind of think that maybe that wasn't really true? Mm, I think initially when I was younger, it, it troubled me a little bit. Then it just started, it didn't make any sense. It didn't make sense at all. And because I was an avid reader and I had just sort of more exposure to the world outside my small town or the religious texts. So it inherently just didn't make any sense to me. So I just rejected it and never really looked back. And I imagine your experience and the fact that you identify as a gay man helps you as a psychologist working with the LGBTQ plus community because you're a part of it. Right. So what we do, what I do is called LGBTQ affirmative therapy. And what that is, a therapy that affirms, which is very supportive of and affirms your gender identity or sexual orientation, is different. Many therapists can be LGBT friendly, LGBT supportive, but they don't have that innate knowledge of what it's like in the day-to-day embodied experience of the minority stress and all those kind of things, which I have access to. And also knowing the resources in the community where to go, where are the support groups, things like that, and being very formative. Yeah, you're certainly known as the LGBT and transgender expert psychologist in Hong Kong, for sure. Like, definitely, I refer to you as that, and I've heard other people refer to you as that as well. So that's really cool. And I don't know that there are many other people with your level of experience. I believe there are two or three others in the community, but definitely an avenue that's not very richly populated. Sure. What's your impression of the attitude towards it all in Chinese culture? And do you think that that attitude is harmful or do you think it's kind of just more sort of let's push it to the side? Well, there's a huge stigma, you know, in less so in Hong Kong, more so in mainland China. So many of the clients I work with are expats. It's a little bit of a different community there. But I do work with some individuals who are local and local families that have always lived here. So it's more of a kind of don't ask, don't tell, more of a sweep under the rug, don't talk about it. Because in those families, it's not an issue. It's not a religious issue. It's not an issue of you're going to go to hell. It's an issue of losing face for the family. It's the issue of shame. And in some cases, if you are gay, the fear that you won't be able to carry on the family name. So in that case, many individuals live double lives. Yeah, to be fair, you know, even heterosexual people who are single can live double lives in the Chinese culture by having the, I forget what it's called, but it's something like buy a boyfriend, you know, you Mm -hmm. pay to have somebody to go home with you to present as your partner. Oh. Yeah, I forget what it's called. Well, we have an issue with compensated (laughs) dating, but that may be different. But yeah, compensated dating, I think that's where you get paid to date. Michael, what would you say to a family or parents who have a child who seems to be identifying in a different way to their gender in the way that they play at a very young age? So say they're a little boy who wants to dress up as a fairy and play with pink things and seems to want to be much more involved in girl style activities. Well, you should let them, basically. You should let them explore who they are. There's no harm in that. There is harm in forcing them to do something that is not in their nature or they don't wish to do. If someone who is a boy wants to dress in pink and play with dolls, you force them to play with trucks or army soldiers, something like that. 
that is actually harmful. Children know what they want and they know what they want to play with. And they're just curious. They're just exploring. And so many children are gender fluid, basically. And not all children, of course, who are gender fluid then later identify as transgender. Sometimes they're just exploring. They're just curious. And we should support that. You know, as I said, we do have children who can identify as transgender as young as two and three. They'll be saying things like, mummy, I'm a girl. Correct. Rather than when they've got male genitalia. Right. Why do I have this thing? Or, you know, when's God going to turn me into a girl or things like that? So they'll be making very specific statements, won't they? Very specific. What are the repercussions of not affirming a child's identity as they grow up and giving them that love that they need? There are repercussions in terms of their mental health. So they're not feeling affirmed. Their whole identity is being denied. You're denying them as a person, basically. So that leads to, of course, depression, anxiety, can lead later in life to substance abuse. We see substance abuse and self-harm and suicide attempts. And these children grow up with, of course, zero self-esteem, no sense of support, and no trust, no trust in authority figures, just no trust in the world around them. I guess it can have a knock-on effect of them being unable to form meaningful relationships with other Mm -hmm. people as well because they don't really have any sort of bonds when they're younger. Is Mm -hmm. that true? An inability to attach, you know, an inability to trust people. What do you think that transgender teenagers need from schools and the community? A lot, really, right? What sort of things can we in schools and within the community do to support trans teens? So, of course, schools and communities, but I'll talk about schools specifically, should have inclusive policy, should be, it's what we call diversity and inclusion, right? So an inclusive school policy should have specifically enshrined in the policy how to handle issues around transgender students and some of the ways in which that can be accomplished is by sensitivity trainings for not just the teachers, but everyone who interacts with the students, right? Cafeteria workers, drivers of the transportation, everyone who interacts with students and working on getting them to understand the language that they use and and other things. So those kind of seminars and workshops are important. Having a zero tolerance for bullying. And also, I'll go back to the language that the teachers use in the classroom. We want to be as much as possible to not use gender. So maybe instead of yeah, yeah, boys go over in that group and Correct. girls come over here. Instead yeah. of doing the boys and girls, you say students or scholars or whatever. But we don't need to use the gender terminology because there are students in your classroom, whether you know it or not, who identify as transgender, who identify as non-binary, neither male nor female. So in those cases, if you're putting them in boy-girl groups, where do they go? So they feel that they just don't really exist. So that's not very healthy. And what about things like changing rooms, bathrooms, PE, mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. like that? Well, the bathroom issue is a huge issue and has been, especially in the States, you know, recently. And it is important to have a, we call it safe space. So gender neutral restrooms, unisex restrooms, maybe just have a stall or similar to kind of a restroom for disabled individuals. They can use that restroom. They could use the restroom might be something that's reserved for faculty or staff, but they do need to have that space. And when it comes to the changing rooms and PE, it's is somewhat controversial, but studies have shown that children need to be able to use the changing room of the gender of their choice, actually. And if other individuals have an issue with that, we think that that's their issue, actually. And it just means that they can go into the changing room, they could go into the stall, you know, that are still, there's privacy there. Do you think that the discrimination against LGBTQ and trans kids comes more from adults than their peers? Or do you think it depends on where they are? Well, it really depends. I think in general, the younger generations are certainly more accepting and I've seen that it's not even an issue, you know. And I think for when the younger ones, four or five, six-year-olds, they don't see that as an issue as anything, you know, because they'll say, Mark is a girl today or in the same way they would say that Sally is a goldfish. I mean, it yeah. doesn't matter. They're yeah. children. They don't have that innate see, bias and hatred and tolerance is not born. It's taught, right? So children don't mind. And I'm seeing more and more with the teenagers I work with when I ask issues about their own sexual orientation. It's just not something they think about much. They don't care. It's who they're attracted to. And it's becoming less and less 
an issue about the gender of the individual. What's the youngest age of a transgender child that you've worked with? I think maybe 10 or 11. Okay, so yeah, it can start quite young. And what about LGBTQ youth? Do you see gay and lesbian youth as much as you see transgender youth in your yes, clinic? Yes, I do. I'd see more because transgender is definitely a, a smaller population percentage-wise. So I have plenty of gay, lesbian, and bisexual teenagers and youth. And again, I have many who just don't really identify the sexual fluid. We would say sexual fluid. So they're in, in the stage of adolescence. And as teenagers, people are experimenting anyway. How important is it for somebody who is struggling with their gender or sexual identity to seek help and see a therapist, do you think? How useful is it? Well, it is incredibly useful, especially if they are not in a supportive family or if they're not in a supportive church or religious community that forbids their sexuality or shames their sexuality. So they need to have some sort of affirmative therapist or someone in their life to give them that validation that it's okay to be who you are and to have these thoughts and these feelings that is normal. What resources are out there that parents can access if they have a transgender or LGBTQ child? So the internet can be a great place and an awful place depending yeah, on yeah, what, you, what you Yeah, it depends where you're looking, yeah. But there are plenty of resources. As an American, I, you know, I use the American Psychological Association, which is APA.org. There are many other resources such as GLAD, if you know GLAD, G-L-A-A-D.org. Yes. A resource that I particularly like because it's for students is transstudent.org, T-R-A-N-S student.org. And it has information and resources for students who are struggling with these kind of feelings or being accepted. And also parents can use it. There's also the It Gets Better campaign, which is really good. There's loads of videos of high profile LGBTQ stars and celebrities talking about their experiences and how saying it does get better. I do believe there's a lot more bullying in American schools than there is in Hong Kong schools and perhaps anywhere else in the world. What's your opinion on that? I absolutely agree. Here in Hong Kong, we do see bullying, I see, but it's not the main source of conflict. I think sometimes family acceptance is more difficult, that the kids are more accepted perhaps in school than they are at home. So I don't see it as a high rate of bullying. I think in the U.S. right now, it's a very sort of politically charged environment and things are very tense. I do hear stories of higher you know, bullying in the States, but we do have it in Hong Kong, for sure. What advice would you give to a young person struggling with their gender identity or their sexual orientation? Well, the campaign you just mentioned, It Gets Better, it hits on those three words, it gets better, and it does. So just letting them know that there are successful LGBTQ adults. And in Hong Kong in particular, it's the industries like the banking industry and the legal industry kind of leading the way forward in terms of diversity and inclusion. So these banks and law firms have diversity and inclusion sort of networks, LGBTQ support groups. They run programs. I think is Goldman Sachs that runs an LGBTQ mentorship program which pairs LGBTQ professionals with university students. So to have a role model and a mentor. That's great. For networking. Yeah, and they do it annually in the fall. So and just letting the kids know that we LGBTQ adults are out here and we're professional and we live happy lives and it will be okay. Yeah, and that's what they need. And I think if schools can do a little bit more of that sort of inclusive sort of message in their teaching, that's a good way forward as well. So somehow putting that into their curriculum, such as maybe, you know, LGBTQ uh, History Month, which is October most of the time, I think in the UK is in February, because October also is National Coming Out Day, which I think is usually the 11th, I believe. So there's events like that, because we do have in, in the US, you know, we'll have like Black History Month and other significant ones. And I think LGBT his history is significant and many people don't know because most of the history books have taken out alternative sexual identities. But there are many heroes and many scientists and many people 
who are LGBT, but the history is sort of whitewashed or taken that out. Yeah, they have. So that's really good advice for any schools or teachers out there to have a look at that. We ran an ally week at our school last year Mm. for the first time where we looked at allyship and just being a supportive bystander as well as people feeling that they belong if they're a part of the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And it was so well received and it was fantastic. And you know, we've got an LGBTQ plus alliance group and that's run by a bunch of kids who are out and proud and it's really wonderful. Mm-hmm. I wish we could see that in more schools around the world. Definitely. And letting them know about events like Pride. And so in Hong Kong, Pride yeah. is a month long celebration called the Pink Season. Other, other cities, Pride may just be one weekend. I think any Pride event is better than none at all. But so letting people know about it, but putting out flyers. Yeah, because that gets them to help to find their community and gives them a sense of belonging, which can help build their self-esteem and then help develop their identity, which is so important. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Find their tribe. Yeah, right. find their tribe. We all need our tribe. I found mine in podcasting, right, right, exactly. <laughs> which is really cool. Michael, finally, what advice would you give to parents if they feel that their child may be questioning their sexuality or their gender identity? Believe it or not, I'll probably say congratulations. You know, it's really, you have a very intuitive and sensitive and curious child who is self-aware. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I think that really is a wonderful thing that a child is able to question, which means that they are probably leaps and bounds ahead of some of their peers in terms of their own development. So I think it's actually a wonderful thing and you should encourage it and you should support it. And congratulations to the parents who even recognize that in their child. Right. Because they are then obviously tuned into their children and that's also a wonderful thing because it shows that they know their child. Mm, Absolutely. And then if you're afraid or unsure or you're worrying about it, research go to some of these places that you've already mentioned and find out more about it because knowledge is power. And the more knowledge that you have and the better understanding you have about this community, the easier it is for you to accept. Knowledge is absolutely power. And if you're just not equipped, because there's a lot of language and a lot of sort of vocabulary and a lot of terminology. So come to a professional such as myself. And many parents have come to me to say, I think my child might be struggle with their sexual identity. And we can talk about that. Exactly. Seek help and speak about it. Don't feel ashamed and certainly don't bury it. Absolutely. There's no shame. There's no stigma. It's a wonderful thing it is to be celebrated. You have a very curious and inquisitive and amazing child. So Dr. Michael Eason, thank you so much for talking to me today. If people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? I am at a clinic in Central Mind and Life. So you could reach me there. I have my website. My personal website is michaeasonhk.com. Brilliant. And for my listeners out there, if you know someone who you feel would benefit from listening to this podcast or you think they'd be interested in today's topic, then please can you share it with them? Please can you take the time to rate and review us and help us move up on the iTunes charts? And it also makes it easier for people to find this podcast and learn about these important issues that we're covering today. If you'd like to buy some Hong Kong Confidential merchandise, please go to the Ozcast Network webpage. And there's also merchandise for my book, Fool Me Twice, on the Ozcast page. And you can buy your copy of my book, Fool Me Twice, about how I was scammed and injured online dating on Amazon. And just remember, as Brené Brown says, owning our story and loving ourselves through the process is the bravest thing that we'll ever do. Michael, thank you so much. This has been so enlightening and such an important conversation. It's been delightful. Thank you. Hi, Confidants. I want to tell you about my Patreon page. I've joined Patreon in the hope of getting sponsorship for my Hong Kong Confidential podcast. Patreon is a great way for my listeners to get on board and sponsor me with monthly payments, and that goes towards my production costs and rewards for my members. If you're interested in checking out my Patreon page, please go to patreon.com and search up Jules Hannaford or Hong Kong Confidential. I would really appreciate you visiting my page. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me. And I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. 
you can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.